puts up with wicked men. And I want to read the first nine verses of the 13th chapter of Luke. Everybody is in place now, I trust. You can put it down, brother, that after service as we had last night in these days, Satan is going to fight tonight. There were present at that season some that told him, that's the Lord, of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. This was an actual occurrence where the Roman governor had uh, murdered a bunch of people, mixed their blood with the blood of the bullocks and so forth that they sacrificed. Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things. I said, No. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise, they've already, now you, it's head of you, you shall all likewise perish. For those eighteen men upon whom the tower in Siloam fell, that's what we would have called an accident, every one of them was killed. You think that they were sinners? above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? No. Except ye repent your feet, give you a little more time, and we'll be like there, ye shall all likewise perish. And in order to illustrate how God deals with men, while they wait, this judgment, while the judgment tarries, he told them a story. He spake also this parable. So we're going to have him throw some light on how God deals with men while judgment is suspended. So listen to the story. He said a certain man had a fig tree. It was his fig tree. It belonged to him. And he planted it in his vineyard. Vineyard belonged to him. And so he came and had a perfect right to and sought fruit from this fig tree that belonged to him that he planted in the vineyard that belonged to him. And naturally, harvest time came. He came looking for fruit. That's the purpose of having a vineyard, planting a fig tree in it. When harvest time comes, the owner would naturally expect to go around and have some figs. But he found none. Found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree. Three years. Every harvest time for three years, the owner of the fig tree that is growing in the vineyard that belonged to the owner and was put there for the purpose of bringing figs, he came for three solid years and expecting to find fruit and find, found none. So he said, cut it down. Why cumber it hit the ground? You see, somehow another got out on us some years since, I don't know just when, that a Christian ought to honor God. Christian ought to worship God. Christian ought to love God. But nothing's expected of a man unless he's a Christian, but that's not so. That's not so. It is not true that God takes us Christians all the time. Every human being is under that obligation. You see, the man who doesn't thumbs his nose at God 
and denies that God's the Creator. And oh, oh. You see, here is the Holy God who owns a, a world and everything in it and the whole purpose of the whole shoot match is the glory of the Sovereign Redeemer and the only reason on earth God ever created anybody or made a world or anything else was it that for it to bring glory to God and everybody you don't have to answer to God if you're a fig tree for not bearing figs the man ought to get out to the Christian order and remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy or if you get stumbled out of the Lord's day, the principle is the same. No, no, it's not true that God expects God's people to reverence this day. He expects everybody to. You see, there's never been a man created yet except that that man, the purpose of that creation was to glorify God. God's got a right to expect of a person he owns in his world, and this is still God's world, and the very heart of sin is to play like this world don't belong to God, you are the boss. It's just to live in God's world, drink the water that only God can make, you try to make some. Breathe the air that only God can furnish, you manufacture some. Grow a tree, you try to grow one. You see, this thing's serious. Isn't it going to be terrible when this generation gets to hell and has to suffer for robbing God of what God says is mine? The tithe is mine, says the Lord. You see, that's not just for Christians, that's for everybody. Isn't it going to be awful when this generation splits hell wide open and has to suffer for how it's turned God's holy day into a holiday? Wouldn't you hate being the sheep of men and women who are promoting homosexuality in both sexes by the parade of naked flesh that's so disgusting that the growing evil of this day is not adultery between sexes. That's not what's taking America. The men are so disgusted with this awful, vulgar, sloppy, piggish parade of naked flesh that not only all respect for but all desire, which is normal for the opposite sex, bids fair to utterly disappear in your generation and mine. I wish we could face the fact that you live in God's world under his laws, and if you break them, they'll still be there. You'll just break yourself. And he's going to require all this at the hands of this lawless generation. We ought to camp here a little while. I don't know. We ought to God help us, Brother Jackson, out a little bit to explode this terrible thing that the creed that crept in on us in America that nobody but a Christian is supposed to live like. Every human being is commanded to love God with all his heart, and with all his soul, and with all his strength. This generation has the slightest conception of the fact that the law is trampling as God's law. That the grace is despising is God's grace, and that the judgment they're headed to is God's judgment. 
This man that owned the fig tree that he planted in those vineyards, the whole Lord, the whole Lord talking about it, you get the story. This is God. You are his by creation. And more than that, you are his by redemption. For in that sense, God created all men, and in that sense, bore all men and turned them over to his blessed Son on the cross. The scriptures warn us not to deny even wicked men who are said to deny the Lord that bought them. I didn't say he saved them, but he bought them. Every human being belongs to God Almighty by creation and by redemption. God's got a right to expect that that man shall glorify God every day of his life. Greatest human document that's ever been penned up till now, not the Bible, but the greatest human document of the course, the old Westminster Confession. It's not perfect, but it's a great document. And the heart of it is, what is the chief end of man? And the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And if a man lives in God's world, and if I does not promote the glory of God, you'll just have to come to the judgment without a mediator and endure the awful pangs of God's holy lash forever against all those who are guilty of breaking his holy law. He comes again and again for three years and finds no fruit. He says, well, just cut it down. It's just cumbering the ground. No earthly use doesn't bring forth fruit. That poor little girl parading around with her naked flesh probably was in Sunday school last Sunday. Why don't God cut her off? Oh, my soul. Why does God not just say, well, I'm going to bring an end to this outfit and send everybody to hell? But the dresser, when the master said, I'm going to, we'll just cut it down three years and no fruit, the dresser answered and said, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I dig about it and fertilize it. And if you'll just let it alone, go and cut it down for one more year, and let me go knock on the door one more time, witness, salt my witness with my tears, my prayers, shower, my love upon that. Don't cut it down yet. Just, just let me, just let me. Oh, no, don't cut down right now. Let me, let me, let me, let me try my best to dig about it and put rich fertilizer on it for one more year. And if it bears fruit, well. And if not, then after that, thou shalt. Cut it down. What is the attitude of the generation you live in? And I wonder if you share it, for I remind you that unless you have been delivered from the spirit of this awful age, you are not a child of God. What is the, the attitude? Revelry. Eat, drink, and be merry. My soul. If there's any difference in us today in hogs, I don't know what it is. If there's anybody around that isn't giving the impression that nothing on God's earth amounts to hill of beans except the gratification of the lustful desires of our poisonous flesh. My, what a carnival of eat, drinking the merry is America tonight. Some in one's nose that almighty God passing the highway going 80 miles an hour and wreck after wreck and just feed up to 90 and some you know that God and say furry on that old book that says whatever a man sows actually also reap anybody's got sense enough to know now that that's not so. Here's a verse of scripture I can prove ain't so. Why? You can, you can sin sexually now and not pay for it, apparently. 
Isn't that right? You can get drunk. I used to preach to the old colonel in the army. He'd get boiling drunk every Saturday night. He had some sort of pill or needle or something, sobered him up. He'd sit on the front seat in chapel every Sunday morning. Only time I ever got fired, it didn't stick, but I had a lot of opposition back in the fighting days, and wife and I had to go out of town, and the opposition saw the dust of my car, and they called a meeting and fired me. They had to go to a lot of trouble. The favorite doctor in town had to stick a needle in two of the deacons to sober them up enough so one could make the motion and the other the second. That's the truth. But they got sober enough to fire the priest. Yes. Yes. You can beat God now, apparently. It just ain't so. Anybody tell you that? What things soever you sow, you'll reap. Nobody believes that. That's one verse of the Bible. That this wise generation's knocked into a cocked hat. Some of you know that's the law, that it doesn't come true, that you will in time reap exactly what you sowed. We'll have to throw the whole Bible away and this world will explode. This generation thinks it's found a way to be this law. If you sow, you'll reap. Rejection of the Lordship of Christ, this generation reeks with lawless rebellion against the first killing claims and demands of the Lord Jesus Christ. Resistance of the Holy Ghost has been so powerful, even in my short life, that some of us are scared half out of our wits, and that the Holy Spirit is almost withdrawn and said of this generation, let it go, let it go. Why don't God put a stop to all this rebellion? Why don't God just come? to a generation that's bringing glory to flesh and glory to nakedness and glory to drunkenness and glory to lawlessness and magnifying everything except holiness. Why don't God come? He just winds it up. You know what trouble God has to do to bring another flood? Scientists tell us he just has to raise the level of sea a half an inch. It wouldn't have much trouble until the whole world would be drowned. That wouldn't be any trick at all for a big God. Why does God put up with this wicked, rebellious, lawless, hell-raising, holiness, despising, God-hating, Holy Spirit-resisting, Christ-rejecting generation? When you read the Word of God, you find out for certain that the holy character and the mark out stated, not hidden, stated purpose and program of God demand that in God's good time, wickedness shall be punished, sin shall be punished, hell shall receive the victims. That's in the purpose of God. The wicked shall be turned into hell, says the word of God. There's no doubt about it. That's in the purpose and in the plan of Almighty God. Why don't he do it now? Why don't he do it now? Why don't he come and cut somebody maybe here tonight? Oh, it wouldn't be much trouble all he'd have to do. Just not to give you your next breath upon him, your absolute dependent for your next breath. His breath, our breath is in his hand, says the scripture. Not in the doctor's hand. You can't, you can't breathe unless he gives you the breath. It's his. He wouldn't have to send a cyclone to send every last one of us to hell tonight. We have to withhold our breath. Yeah, man. Why don't he do it? He has sworn that he'll by no means spare the guilty. His honor's involved, his character's involved. 
If he ain't none, don't cry forever. There's all this rebellion in there. Purposeful, wicked, malicious trampling of the blood of the Son of God under their feet. Then he's not a God who's worthy of anybody's respect. He's simply a weakling or a monster or worse. Why don't they cut the tree down now? I was in Chicago, and one day, just to see what was going along, I spent almost a half a day down on State Street, where the dives and the missions and the forum and so forth. And I was amazed at how many soapbox orators preaching to that little crowd in, in one block's space under police protection in those days. Communists were allowed to stand up on a box and cuss the government and cuss God and cuss everything. And I remember I stood and heard a man making fun of God and calling him every wicked name he could think of and reckling his boldness. He began to shake his fist. And he says, God, if you're there, I don't believe you are, but if you are like these so-called Christians, see, and you don't like what I'm saying about you, I don't want to come down and do something about it. And there either wasn't any God up there, or he is so weak he couldn't do anything, or he just didn't do anything. What do you think? You see, you talk about things that are hard to understand. If there is a living God, biggest mystery I face is why he don't cut this generation down and send it to hell before midnight. Why don't he do it? Why will God let a dirty mouth communist cuss him and call him vile names? Not doing anything about it. Why would God let those godless, diabolical, devilish Students out found in California uh, cause riots and parades through the streets with dirty, balls of filthy letters demanding the right to parade such filth in the name of liberty. Why didn't God kill them and send them to hell? Why did God allow Adolf Hitler to murder? Six million Jews in those gas furnaces use the ashes to make soap out of. Why didn't God cut him off sooner than he did? Why hadn't God already killed you? That's quite mysterious. Why hadn't he killed me? creating rock barnet. Rock barnet should glorify him. Yes, the year! For nearly 23 years, I someone knows had a godly home that the greatest Christian man I ever knew, my daddy, had a Christian education, cradled in Baptist Sunday schools, educated in Baptist college, Bring the soul running around as I'll try to bring the message on when God saved an infidel and I was the infidel. Why didn't God cut that stinking little rat off? Instead of bringing glory to God, I was able to lead hundreds of young college students in the infidelity, no telling how many of them in hell tonight. Why didn't God kill me? Haughty rebels despising God's authority, remembering that God's love is a holy love, and thus he hates all evil. For it's written, this is a hard passage of Scripture, God is said to hate all workers of iniquity. Did you get that? That's in God's word. Oh, this cat cat that God loves everybody, but the Bible says that God hated all workers of iniquity. God's not left us in doubt how he regards those who openly and persistently defy him. Again and again in the Bible, God makes known to us the solemn fact that he looks upon the wicked as cumbers of the earth. 
as repugnant to him, they're dross, not gold. He calls them worthless chaff. He calls them vipers, vessels of dishonor, vessels of wrath. He speaks of people as trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the rocks, and therefore fit for nothing but the fire. Why doesn't God cut people off just like that? Why does it put up with the wicked? I'll tell you why. One day, he who has been hanging on the cross in the purpose and heart of Almighty God forever and ever, one day in time, they took a man by the name of Jesus and nailed him to a tree. And what he did there has stayed the stroke of God's final judgment. And the wickedest sinner in Houston tonight can blaspheme God sin against his body, sin against his spirit, sin against his country, sin, and a power of death. Nothing will happen. Why? Because something's already happened, brother. The Lord of glory hung on that tree. And when he did that, hear me now. He fixed it so you can raise hell and not be judged at once. If it weren't that Jesus Christ was even now in the heart of God hanging on that cross, every sinner in Houston who committed one act of sin the day he would have been cut off and sent to hell. I do not know how to deal with your theories of the atonement. You can fool them if you want to, but I studied them so much I don't know. But there's one thing I do know, that because my Jesus died, you can spit in the face of God, trample his holy laws, insult his holy spirit, ignore his blessed word, Ignore his blessed church. You can just have your big time. And because Christ Jesus endured God's awful stroke of judgment on sin, having been made sin, nail that. God won't cut you down. He'll let somebody dig about you. He'll keep his loving hand on you. He'll shower you with more blessings. But one day, hear me now, one day the rainbow that surrounds the throne of God now is going to disappear. And it'll be a naked throne. Nothing but judgment. Because the dear Savior poured out his precious blood. God in mercy and grace to all mankind. For God shows mercy and grace enough to the wickedest sinner out of hell to leave him without excuse, not to save him, but to fix it so if he splits hell wide open it'll be to blame himself. And every goodness that comes to the wickedest sinner out of hell comes to him because Jesus died. Jesus died. It'll haunt you in hell that that good job you've got, reading you've got is Jesus died. You haven't got anything. I don't care where you saved or still on the road to hell. It isn't God's gift of mercy and grace 
that he showers on all men because Jesus died. Cut it down, no, let me have one more year, one day. It's going to be payday. One day the pot's going to boil over. One day going to come looking for fruit and there'll be none. You'll say, cut it down. That'll be payday for men and women. If we had the slightest inkling of how good God is to rebels, how long suffering he is. He said, hold back judgment. Let him alone. Don't cut him down yet. But I wish I'd get out on the street car and fight this generation down. they have to have because Jesus died. Everything they have that's good to have because Jesus died. They don't care a bit about him. They don't want anybody to talk to him about it. The one thing that they owe everything to have and are, even if they go to hell right now, you owe everything you have. The one who died on the cross, he stayed the judgment of God, turned the throne of judgment into a throne of grace and mercy for all mankind. Until the rainbow is gone, that judgment once more shall be a naked, no pity, no mercy, no grace, and that'll be hell. I bless God that I can look every human being in the eye and say, Brother, Jesus so died that you're going to be affected by his death throughout a long eternity. Men and women who take advantage of the fact that the judgment of God is held in check because of the blood of Christ, one day are going to have to run right smack into that naked throne. No rainbow of mercy. And it'll just be hell. I thank God that I can preach without fear anybody successfully contradicting that because Jesus died. God Almighty has shown you enough mercy and grace to leave you utterly without excuse. And I thank God that I can tell men and women that if they had time to face the fact that you are God's creation, you belong to him. He made you and then he redeemed you, bought you. You belong to him. You face that fact that you belonging to him. Living in his world. Violate every requirement and ignore his goodness. Take it for granted. That you desperately need to face the fact that this isn't your world, this is his. These aren't your laws, they're his. This Savior's not your son, it's his. If you face those facts, Instead of taking for granted the death of the Lord Jesus on a Roman cross, it might break your heart until you come and say, I surrender, put your yoke on me. I want to live in God's world and bring forth fruit. That's what I created for. Mercy. Mercy enough so that nobody can condemn God grace enough so that nobody can blame God. Mercy. Mercy and grace. I thank God the scriptures say God's rich in mercy. We're not likely to bankrupt the glory well of mercy. And I thank God the scriptures say he's rich unto all who call on him. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that wonderful? The man stopped ignoring God's goodness and taking it for granted. The man stopped in his mad rush of lawless rebellion against him, living in God's world as if I were God, not under subjection to him. He got no right, got no right to live in my home. 
unless you live by the rules of my own. You got no right to live in God's world. You think you can get by with breaking every rule he's made. You just can't do it. This is God's world. Isn't it wonderful that if a man stop that the promise is God's rich unto all who call on him? Wonder of wonders. We cannot limit his great mercy. And men need that. Yes, since I was holding meetings in Detroit, Michigan. One Sunday morning, a freckle-faced, red-headed, tall guy of a man, his name was Childers. I'll never forget him. He waited until I was sort of free after the service. He came up to me and he said, Brother Preacher, he said, if I'll lay off from work tomorrow and come and get you, will you go preach to a man over in my section of Detroit? That I doubt this thing, and I found a man that had been down in Georgia in a sanatorium. He had drunk so much vile whiskey that had eaten his stomach out, and his stomach was just a mass of cancerous sores. And they kept him down there until they, nothing they could do for him, and they told him that they couldn't help him anymore, that he was going to die pretty soon, and asked him if he'd like them to send him somewhere. Did he have any kinfolks? Would they like him to send him back home or somewhere? And he said, I don't have any folks except a sister. I haven't seen her in 30 years, but she lives in Detroit. And they went to work and found out the sister's address, and they put him on a train, sent him back to Detroit to his sister. And this man child has got acquainted and found out his condition is lying there on the bed dying under great cocaine or something, you know, to keep him from this suffering agony. And when his medicine wear off, Mr. Childers had been trying to witness to him, but he was a vile man. I think he about as good a cusser as I've ever been around, and he just cussed Mr. Childers and cussed God and cussed everything he could think of. This old red-headed fellow said, Brother Barnard, that he don't do nothing but cuss me when I talk to him, said he's dying and he's alone. And in that tragedy, you have to die alone. But alone, nobody can die with you. You have to die alone. Die alone! Cussing God and everything that's high and holy. In agony of body, die. He said, if I came and got you, would you talk to him? I said, well, if you had that much interested, I will. That night came a blizzard, the snow next morning was ten below zero, and the streets were in a bad shape, and that dear man drove thirty miles through traffic sort of like Houston, you know, and finally slipped around and got to me, and I like to fool him to death, and we got in this car and we chugged along, slipped and slid, the snow plows hadn't been able to do the job very well, and finally we got over there at a little old humble house, and we got out and finally got up on the front porch and stomped our feet and so forth, and knocked, and the sister let us in, and we got in, took off our wraps, and uh, he said, uh, Miss So-and-so, this is Brother Barnard, this is a preacher, and I want him to talk to you, brother. She said, well, I'm so sorry, the doctor's just been here, and uh, he gave my brother a double shot of dope, said he was in such pain, said he's sound asleep, and he won't wake up for several hours. That old freckle-faced, red-headed fellow just dropped down on his knees. I was there when it happened. He said, Lord, I've gone 30 miles that way and 30 miles back to get this preacher, and I want him to talk to that man before he dies. Please wake him up. Amen. And the sister went and quietly opened the door, and the minute she came back, utterly confounded, she said, he's awake. He's awake. And I went in and sat down by him, and I started to preach the gospel to him, and he, he drowned out a little sermon. He cursed me, and he cursed God, and he cursed that red-headed fellow, and he cursed Jesus, and he cursed everything he could think of. And finally, he kind of wound down, and it was my time to bat. And the Lord helped me. I began to quote scripture on the judgment of God. I think I must have quoted every scripture in the Bible on eternal hell, for that's what the judgment of God is. 
And I just, I wouldn't let him read. I didn't preach to him. I just quoted him scripture. The wicked shall be turned into hell. They shall go away into everlasting life. The righteous and some other folks shall go away into everlasting punishment. God knows how to preserve the godly from the day of temptation and to reserve the ungodly until the day of judgment to be punished. And I just quoted scripture and quoted scripture and quoted scripture and wouldn't let him get a word in edgewise. I know what else to do. And Rick, I sort of wound down and he's crying. Tears just going down his face. I let him cry a little while. And he said, Preacher, he said, I know I'm going to hell. But when I'm not full of dope, I'm screaming in agony and said, I'm alone. I'm dying and I'm going to hell. And said, I'm scared. And said, Read the cuss so much that I think maybe I can. It kind of helped me forget for a minute where I'm going. He said, I don't want to go to hell, but that's where I know I'm going. Where I know I'm going. I said, how do you know you're going? He said, the way I've lived. There's ever was a man deserved to spend eternity in hell, it be. He said, God wouldn't save me. I said, he wouldn't. He said, no. Well, that's a pretty good candidate. And so I, I began to preach to him. And after a while, his tears went away. And he smiled. I said, what are you smiling about, bud? Oh, he said, he's done the job. I tell you what fact that kind of God would have, you know. And... I said, done what kind of job? He said, there's peace in here. Dear Brother Telly, been in agony. I don't know what's happened, but he says, I got peace. That's good. He gives peace. When fear of hell is gone and the burden rolled away. I don't know till I get to judgment whether you're saved or not. But he said he was. Exactly, he said, Brother Preacher. He said, when I was a boy going to Sunday school, we used to sing a song. It said something about 10,000 years. Oh, I said, that must be amazing. Oh, yes, sir, that's what it was. He said, I never have quite forgotten it. And he said, would you sing it for me? And I said, yeah, I will. An old freckle-faced child is. And I sang amazing grace. It is amazing. Downright, outright amazing. How sweet the sound that saved the rest. Like that old wreck, like. I once was lost, but now I'm found was blind, but now I see. I heard somebody sobbing. The sister who went with the bed just sobbing hard. I said, what's the matter with you? She said, the work's done. Oh, it's just like the God of all grace. To save old sloppy, stinking, filthy sinners. And she joined in on the second verse. It was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieve how precious did that grace appear thou I first believe and the time we got to the last verse that old cusser he is singing well we did there may remember that ten thousand years bright shining as the sun we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun and we took our leave. And it's a bad day. Old brother Freckle Face got behind the wheel, and I noticed the car was doing a lot of zigzagging. Exactly, he flipped over near the curb. He couldn't cut the ignition off. I saw his eyes was full of tears. He said, Brother Bond, he said, you know, that's the way God did with me. Oh, he said, I was speaking and wicked and all as he was. 
And he said, he showed mercy to me. And that old freckle face boy, that a car we sang together, yes, I struck in vanity and pride. Caring not, my Lord was crucified. No, not for me he died on Calvary. And we sang, mercy, there was greed and grace was free. Oh, and there was no surprise to me there. My heart found liberty at Calvary. And we went our way rejoicing. The next day the phone rang. And the sister said, get the preacher, and if he can, get him over right away. My brother's dying, and he's calling. He hopes he can see the preacher once before he dies. And we hurried, but we got there too late. But there lay, and the Shekinah glory was on his countenance, that old cussing, drinking, cancerous, stinking devil.